Thank to our worship leaders for leading us in song. Hey, it's great to be back with you again. I had the privilege last weekend of camping with our pathfinders at Lake Mondrian. And um, although the weather was somewhat dicey, we, had, we managed to have a terrific weekend together. And I've just spent the last four days with my family on Fraser Island after that. Um, but we did get blown away on Fraser yeah. But it's lovely to be back and lovely to share the worship hour with you. My sermon this morning is entitled, Mirror, Mirror on the Wall. This is um, a gentleman by the name name of Scott Neeson. He's an Australian. Lives in Cambodia, but prior to his life in Cambodia, he was a very high-paid executive in the film and movie industry in Hollywood. Uh, it was his job was to promote blockbuster movies internationally. He was on a six-figure income. He drove the latest sports car, and he lived in a flash home in Beverly Hills. But he wanted to take some time out, and so he went for a holiday to an exotic place. He thought, where's an exotic place I can go? Cambodia. Cambodia, of course, has many, many um, ancient ruins of temples and um, lots of pretty sights to see. And while he was in Cambodia... He happened to, perhaps providentially, stumble across the city dump. And it was while at the city dump that he saw or encountered for his first time in his life abject poverty. He saw people literally scavenging off the refuse of society. It was while he was standing there that his mobile phone rang. He obviously had an international SIM card in it. And when he answered the phone, it was the agent of a very well-known Hollywood actor on the line complaining about the food service on the private Learjet that his client had experienced. And in the background, the act, he could hear the actor saying to him, to, speaking to her agent, my life wasn't meant to be this hard. And for Scott, that was an epiphany moment. He thought, this is ridiculous. Here I am serving these people who are so, so affluent. And he said, there are people like this in the world who have nothing. And he decided there and then that he was going to quit his job as a film executive and do whatever he could to help the poor people in Cambodia. Well, if I can just get the next slide. One of the things that really struck him the most was the children. To see little children each ecking out an existence on the rubbish dump, scavenging for whatever they could find and probably earning no more than a dollar a month from what they could find. And he thought something has got to be done to help these kids. So he went back home. He sold his house. He sold his car. He sold all, he had a garage sale, sold all the possessions in his house, and he went back and he set up a school for these kids. Now, he knew that the only way to overcome poverty was to educate these people, to get themselves out of poverty. Yes, he, he immediately made sure that they had um, food for themselves. He, he started up some cottage industries where he employed people to prepare food for these kids. And so he's trying to create these sort of little cottage industries that would eventually benefit each other. And the immediate, immediate concern, of course, is to provide nutritionist food for people, but you need to educate people to do that for themselves. It's the old saying, teach a man to fish and he'll be fed for life. But he knew that education was the greatest way to achieve that, and so he set up these schools. And he would go back to America to his old movie buddies, movie industry buddies, and he would tell them what he was doing because they were just fascinated that this guy would walk away from his lifestyle of the rich and famous and throw himself into helping the poorest of the poor in the world. And he would, hold, he would host um, special dinners for his friends and he would ask them to contribute financially. By this time, he had exhausted most of his own resources and he was now dependent on other people providing to help his kids. Well, the wonderful thing is that the, some of the children that he first rescued off the dump, literally, and has educated, 
are now working for him in other cottage industries that are, that are creating like a mini economy to keep these people out of sheer poverty. And I couldn't help but think him when I heard of Scott's story. It was on um, Australian Story a few years ago. I couldn't help but think him when I saw it. That here is a man who came to the realisation that life does not consist in the abundance of our possessions, which is a statement that Jesus made. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And we've been doing a series called Encounters with Jesus. And this morning I want to look at the story of the rich young man and his encounter with Jesus. And by this time in Jesus' ministry, his ministry was impacting the society around him. People were starting to sit up and take notice of what this itinerant Galilean rabbi was saying and doing. And it was impacting their local society there in Judea. You see, Jesus had shared with people the values of his kingdom. And scripture tells us time and time again that when Jesus had finished speaking to the crowds, people were amazed at his words. What was so amazing about what Jesus was sharing? Perhaps it was the values that he was sharing with them were so different to the values of this world. For example, he talked about happiness. Happiness being found in those kingdom values. And we, we refer to it now as the Beatitudes recorded in, in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are they, or happy are they, who are poor. Happy are they who are poor in spirit. Happy are they who, um, who mourn. Happy are they who are persecuted. Happy are they who thirst for righteousness. Jesus also said that where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. Whatever it is you throw yourself into, heart and soul, that will reveal the treasure of your life, the things that you value in life, the importance that you place on things in life. He had the cure for worry. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things that you worry about will be added to you because God will take care of your needs. He offered rest for those who were weary. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He taught us to trust, to have the trust in God like that of a little child, the implicit trust that a child has in his parent. Jesus said that eternal life is found only in him and that all scripture met its fulfillment in his life, death and resurrection. And of course we can't go past the I am statements that Jesus made throughout his ministry. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. And indeed anyone who took the time to stop and listen to him was never the same again. When the temple guards were sent to arrest him, they came back empty-handed, and those that had just sent them on their errands said, Where is he? Didn't you bring him in? And they answered, No one ever spoke like this man. No one ever spoke like he has. I haven't even mentioned the various miracles and healings that Jesus did in his, in his ministry that also attracted people's attention. And eventually, right at the end, the authorities of the day said, if we let him carry on like this, everyone will believe in him and we will lose our nation to the Romans. Yes, Jesus was having an impact on the people of his day. So much so that the rich young man had heard about Jesus, had heard about his kingdom values, and he sought him out one day because he wanted to know. He knew, deep down inside, there was something missing in his life. He had it all, and he had it all together, or so he thought, but there was something missing 
in his life. And I want to share with you the story of that. You'll find it in Mark chapter 19. Uh, sorry, Mark, Mark chapter 10 and Matthew chapter 19. I'll be referring to both passages this morning. But if you want to pick it up with me, or we'll read through Mark, sorry, Matthew, Matthew chapter 19. It's been a big week. Matthew 19 and verse 16. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones? the man inquired. Jesus replied, Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony. Honour your mother and father and love your neighbour as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said, what do I still lack? He knew there was something missing. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. What must I do was the first inquiry that he had. Surely there's something I have to do. What have I got to do to be a part of this movement that you have started? What have I got to do to embrace the values of your kingdom that you're sharing with people? In other words, how can I be a part of that. Like Nicodemus before him, he asked the kingdom question. Nicodemus may have come from a different, at a different time of day, and he may have come from a, from, with a different motive to see Jesus, but the, the bottom line was they both asked the same question. What have I got to do to be a part of your kingdom? Because the kingdom that you are espousing is very different to the, one that, the world that we live in. Both men were very wealthy, but as we have learnt already from our, our time looking at the story of Nicodemus, wealth was not a snare to Nicodemus. Yes, he was wealthy, but it wasn't a snare to him. And as different people have different needs, Jesus targeted his approach to this young man to meet the need that was specific to his life. The message that Jesus shared with Nicodemus was totally different. Nicodemus needed to see his spiritual bankruptcy. This guy had an idol in his life that was standing in between him and God. He had an idol that he needed to see, and Jesus wanted to help him to see it. Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. The first thing that Jesus wanted to get out, for, out of him or help him to see was a, an acknowledgement of the divine, an acknowledgement that he stood in the very presence of God himself. Because in the next couple of challenging statements Jesus would make, this young man needed to know that he was speaking with God himself. Obey the commandments was the encouraging thing that Jesus said. And would we not be surprised to hear Jesus say that? Obey the commandments? Surely there's more to eternal life than our sheer obedience. How did Moses describe the commandments that he shared with the children of Israel? He said, these words that I give to you today are not idle words, but they are your life. The words of God are the very words of life. When, we, when, we, when Jesus says, obey the commandments, he wanted to help this young man see, even though he thought he was pretty good, he wanted to help him see that there was something that was standing in the way of him following God with all his heart and all his soul. And so which ones, he asked, 
he has spent a life of obedience to the law, or so he thought. What, what could I possibly have missed? Jesus is beginning to hone in on the idol of his life. What could I possibly have missed? And so Jesus describes what we refer to as the second table of the law, that which pertains to our relationship with our fellow man. And Jesus tacks onto that the reference to love your neighbour as yourself, which comes from the book of Leviticus. And when Jesus was asked what was the summation of the law, he sent the question back to the person who asked them that and said, how do you read it? He said, to love God with all your heart and your fellow man as yourself. And Jesus said, you've answered correctly. If you want to sum up the law, that's what the two tables of the law mean. But in this copy, if you like, or of this retelling of the second table of the law, Jesus leaves out one obvious omission. And it's like the elephant in the room. Do you know which one he's missed out? Covetousness. You shall not covet. And here, now, Jesus had put his finger on the heart of this man's problem. Yeah, sure, the first table of the law that was not, was not mentioned was to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. This man was a God-fearing, Sabbath-keeping, tithe-paying, kosher-eating, festival-observing Jew. But he knew that there was something missing in his life. What do I still lack? Was the question, the burden of his heart. What do I still lack? Well, in Mark's rendition of this story, Mark 10, verse 21, tells us, the next verse says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus made eye-to-eye -eye contact with this guy. He didn't have to say anything, but that look alone conveyed the love that God had for this young man. Jesus looked at him and loved him. And now Jesus was ready to give him the bitter pill that this guy needed to swallow. This is what the news that he needed to hear because suddenly his idol was before him and Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, sell everything you have and give to the poor. Oh. Sure, Lord, I want to be a part of your kingdom. I want to do whatever you, you say. I want to follow you wherever you go but I don't want to give up the comfort and the security that I have around me. His idol was in his own ability to look after himself. He didn't need God. He didn't realise it. But in his, by his own lifestyle, by his own sheer wealth, he didn't need God. He had enough money to throw at every problem that would come his way. He was a self-made man and he didn't need God. So now we've arrived at the heart of his problem. Wealth was his idol. But Jesus didn't ask him to give up something and then leave him in a void. Yes, he asked him to give up that which was between him and God. But he didn't leave him there to hang out to dry, so to speak, if he was going to ask him to do something great, and he was, just like those, those butterflies that I shared with the children. This guy had had everything done for him in life. He hadn't learned to exercise, to spread his own wings. He'd learned to rely on the wealth that was around him to solve all of his problems. He hadn't learned to exercise faith. He hadn't learned to spread his wings and soar for God. Jesus said to him, yes, sell everything you have. Take away the dependence you have on those things. But then he said, come and follow me. He gave him an alternative. The alternative was there. The path of self-sufficiency or the path of of relying upon God. Come 
and follow me. As Jesus had said to his disciples earlier, hang up your nets and come and follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Had God looked after those disciples from that day forward? He had, hadn't he? And if a young man wanted to live in testimony, the men standing behind him there could have given their testament that God will indeed take care of all of your needs. Come and follow me. But scripture says he went away sad. He went away sad. How tragic. How many people went away from an encounter with Jesus sad that you read about in scripture? How many? Most of the ones I read about skip and leap for joy for what Jesus has done in their lives. You think of the encounters that we have shared so far this year of people who came to a living faith in God by following Jesus Christ and all that Jesus did for them. Every one of them went away joyful and happy. But this man went away sad. So, what can we learn from someone else's experience? What can we learn from this story? What's our take-home package that we can apply to our own lives from this encounter with Jesus today? Do you find yourself coming to, coming to Christ and saying, but what must I do? What must I do? Surely, surely this gospel thing, it sounds too good to be true. And guess what? It is. The gospel is too good to be true. So it sounds too good to be true. But it is. The good news is, you can do nothing to save yourself. And if you don't leave here this morning knowing that, then what, what I've said will be in vain. The gospel is about God doing something for you that you cannot do for yourself. Perhaps this morning you're sitting here as a God-fearing, Sabbath-keeping, tithe-paying, kosher-eating Adventist Christian, but you know there's something missing in your life. What do I still lack? What does my experience, my walk with God still lack? Is there an idol today in your life that is preventing you from a closer walk with God? Is there something that you depend upon more in your life than your relationship with God? Is there something that absorbs more time in your life, more of your time, more of your attention than your relationship with God? And is, is that thing something that you depend upon for your existence, for your sense of identity, then I want to suggest to you that indeed you have an idol in your life. Do you sense an absence of the Holy Spirit in your life? What do I still lack? Do you sense an absence of the Holy Spirit teaching you, guiding you, leading you through life? The experiences of day by day, do you open yourself up to the leading of the Holy Spirit? Do you hear his voice? Do you listen for his voice? Do you look for the opportunities to experience what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life? What do you still lack today? Is Jesus asking you to make some radical changes in your life today? Is Jesus asking you to walk away from something and yet follow him, knowing that he will indeed look after you? Are you at risk today from turning away from this encounter with Jesus feeling sad? Given all that Jesus has, has offered us in eternal life, given all the values of his kingdom that are there before us, that are so different to the value system of this world, 
Are you at risk of walking away today because that kingdom isn't the one that you're looking for? Are you at risk of walking away from Jesus today? Sad. I want to share with you a little passage of scripture this morning from the book of James, James chapter 1. So when Jesus said to this rich young man, obey the commandments, what was he really doing? What was Jesus doing to him when he said, the young man said, which ones? Which ones am I missing? And Jesus listed them off for him. What was he really doing? He was holding up before him, I want to suggest to you, he was holding up before him an area of his life that was incomplete. Remember that the words of God are your very life. James chapter 1, verse 22. James says these words, 22 to 25. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. What was it? Don't just hear. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. What do you do when you look in the mirror? Who do you see when you look in that mirror? Some of you might see more or less than you want to see. What is the purpose of a mirror? Come on, ladies. You spent some time in front of this thing this morning. What does this mirror tell you? It reflects what you look like when you get out of bed, yes. And what do you aim to do with what the mirror tells you? <laughs> Tidy it up. <laughs> Sorry, Dale. <laughs> the mirror points out all of my imperfections. That pimple I had on my nose this morning, that hair that the razor missed, the mirror tells me my faults, doesn't it? James goes on to say, the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives what? Freedom. The perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this. You can't just look in the mirror once and say, yeah, that's what I look like. I remember that. I looked in the mirror once. It was about 30 years ago. You look in the mirror every day just to check on yourself. Am I still there? Not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. The purpose of God's law before us is to highlight our imperfections of character, to highlight our deficiencies of character because there is something in your life this morning, there's something in my life this morning that can stand in the way of a closer walk with God. Indeed, God's law was never done away with. God's law is eternal stands there before us as a perfect example of the character of Christ. What is it that's standing in your way this morning? By his own admission, Scott will tell you he doesn't own a house, he doesn't own a car, he hasn't got any money of his own in the bank but he has never been happier in his life than he is right now at this phase in his life. Scott learned the secret that it... What does it profit a man to gain the whole world? And he had the whole world at his feet. What does it profit to gain the whole world and yet lose your own soul? And a man's happiness does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. This man found the secret of happiness was not in getting, but in giving. 
And perhaps in that epiphanal moment in his own life, he realised that he was chasing an idol of his own success. He was chasing an idol of his own self-sufficiency. And suddenly he was confronted. And perhaps God needed to do that for him. Perhaps that was God's way of reaching his soul. To confront him with the abject poverty of the, of the countless numbers in the world who have nothing but who have everything if they have a faith and a belief in God. My hope for you today, as you encounter Jesus through this story, through someone else's experience, that you will indeed encounter life and happiness as God intended it to be. Don't walk away from this encounter sad because Jesus is holding out to you the very life that he wants you to experience in his kingdom. What will it gain a man, profit a man, if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul? May God bless you as you think about this encounter with Jesus. I'd like to invite our singers to come and lead us to our final hymn.